Hi, welcome to part two of this video, which looks at phased arrays in Python. So if you've watched the first part of the video, which I highly recommend you doing so, we ended when we had created this emitter object, which held a series of circles, which were all separated by lambda naught, or the wavelength between the waves. So now in this video, what we're going to be doing is we're going to actually be animating this emitter so that I can give out waves that are animated over time with the correct phase. And then we'll then go on to adding multiple emitters together to see what happens to their individual waves when we do certain things with their phases. So let's go ahead and continue coding. So we're at the point where we've got these lovely circle objects all separated by lambda naught, but this really is just to see whether this was working. We don't actually need these lambda zeros or these lambda zeros now might not actually be representative. So I'm going to go ahead and remove this because remember if the phase is different then these lambda naughts are different. So where we started from there means nothing, but we have most of the things required to actually be able to animate these. So if I go back, so I was creating this function called increment, which basically says increment the simulation by this time dt. So the first thing to think of when we do a function like this is to say, well, actually, let's increment the time variable t within the emitter itself. So the emitter keeps track at the same time. Let's increment it by dt. We're then going to say, remember, we had this variable t0, which says that if you're starting one of these circles and it's not starting from its start position, so it's not basically not starting from the center of the emitter, then I don't want to plot that yet. I want to wait until it's expanded and then comes back around. And we created this t naught, which basically calculated when that would happen. So we can go ahead and say if self dot t is less than self dot t naught, so basically saying we're not ready yet, they're going to return. So we incremented our time by dt, but we're not ready to do anything with the circles yet. So we're going to return from the function. However, eventually that t is going to get so big that it will overcome this condition and then will no longer return so they need to start doing something what we need to do is we need to go all over all of these different circles and determine whereabouts they should be in space so the easiest way to do this is we're going to do a nice for loop and i'm going to enumerate over all of the circles so what enumerate does is saying where a typical for circle in self.circles would return the circle object by using this keyword enumerate and wrapping it around the circles, what it will return, it will return a tuple. So it return both an I and a circle. So an I will be an actual index that goes from zero to the length of circles, basically. And that's going to be useful because remember each one of these circles is indexed by a value I. So it's indexed by an actual integer. And then we can say, okay, well, what's the radius of the circle going to be? If we look at the formula again, we can see that the radius of the circle is given by this i, which was is self dot lambda in this in the in this example. So self lambda, which is n in this example, but in computing it's more um, it's more common to use i as an index variable or as a counting variable. So let's do self dot lambda zero. Okay, so we know that, and then we also have this second term, which is self dot lambda zero times self dot phi. And then times CT. Okay, so that's saying each of the different circles remember the circles start off at different different radii go over all of them and then increment the radius and it's basically the only thing that's going to be changing by t and as we'll see so let's just put that on a different line neaten things up a bit we then have to do something set the circle so there's a function called circle.setHeight and circle.setWidth. So these map.lib circles have a height and a width, which are basically just going to be 2R, which is what we've just calculated. So if I go ahead and plot that, this isn't going to do anything because we've not told it to do anything. 
we also need to be able to see the circles, which is fine because we can do it there. In this update function, we need to tell it to increment. So we need to say e dot increment. And we need to give it a DT. So let's actually try and do this in real time. So let's give it a increment of one over the FPS. Okay. So is it doing what we want it to do? The answer is no. So if we look, these waves are moving outward unbounded. They're not wrapping around. Remember I said the wave needs to move out to where the previous waves, to where the next indexed circle started. And it needs to wrap back around. We see we didn't actually add any capability for it to wrap back around. So we need to come back here to our increment function where we said here, self.lambda times the spheres offset plus the C, t C times T. All this expression here is a thing that needs to be wrapped. And remember, we've already created a wrap function. So we can simply wrap this expression around. And the actual value it will be wrapped around can only ever get as big as lambda before it has to start again. Let's try this. Wait for it to come up. Is that doing what we want? So let's have a look. Yes. So what you can see, but what is actually happening is this inner circle here is expanding from zero to lambda. As soon as it gets here, it's going straight back to zero and expanding again to lambda, which is here. Okay, the next circle is starting from here and then expanding to two lambda, which is here. And this is done seamlessly. So even though it's wrapping round because they all because the previous the previous indexed circle expands to the beginning in time of the next index circle, it seems like a seamless transition. So it looks like the waves are moving outward. So this is exactly what we want. So that's all set up. The next thing we need to do is we need to do some of these nice pretty plots that I showed at the beginning of the of the previous video where we had multiple emitters emitting all these different waves and they add up nicely. And we could just do that here. So we could just create several different emitters all with different phase relations, for example. I'm not a fan of that. So again, yes, if any of you have seen my previous videos, you know I'm a, I'm a big fan of object-oriented programming, which basically means that I like to think of things as objects. So rather, so an emitter is an object, right? It's something which has properties. You know, it has a point in space, an x y point in space. It has a wave speed. It has a frequency. It has a phase, etc. It also has all these circle objects which can then move in time, etc., etc. So I'm a big fan of object oriented particular programming. So if we have all these individual emitters and then they're combined into something called an emitter array, to me, that's an object. So an emitter array is an object which contains many different emitters. Remember an object can contain many objects. So a box is an object and it can contain many different trinkets, all of which are objects. The trinkets themselves could contain multiple moving parts, for example, which are all different objects. So we're going to create a second class called an emitter array. So the emitter array is going to be a class which contains lots of different emitters. And then we'll also provide some useful methods and properties to for us to be able to interact with the individual emitters themselves or methods and properties to actually abstract those individual emitters themselves. So we don't need to worry about how many emitters there are, for example, or whether or, or whether to increment each one individually, we can just say to the emitter array, okay, I'm only interested in these things, just return these things to me. That's what we're going to be doing here. So let's go ahead and create a class, call it an emitter array. And then we need to think, what does it need when we create it? So the emitter array itself is probably just going to contain a bunch of emitters. We're going to want some capability to add emitters to it. So for the, for now, we'll just do add emitter. We won't do any remove emitters. We're not doing anything fancy with this particular simulation. We're going to call the emitter E and all we're going to do in this function is self dot emitters. Dot append an E. So every time this function is called, it just adds an already existing emitter to itself. So the list that keeps track of all the emitters. 
So that's quite simple. We're also going to implement the increment function. So let's do that. Def increment. And what we're going to say here is okay, so I'm saying increment by dt. So just go into each of the emitters that exist within this self dot emitters and just increment each of those by dt. And this is very nice because it means that all we need to do is create an emitter array, add some emitters to it, and then just increment it once. And it will increment all the individual emitters within the emitter array itself. So the last function we're going to increment is something called get circles. And that will become apparent later on as to why I want to do that. But you can imagine there's be situations where you actually want to be able to extract those individual circles. Because you might need to know something like where's the origin of those circles? What's the radius of those circles? So we can do a function called get circles, which basically says for each emitter in all the emitters that this emitter array holds, then create an array called circles and just add the individual circles from each individual emitter to this. So it will return all the individual circles from the emitter. You can also do something that makes it a bit easier. You can use this property keyword, then at symbol, and that means that when I type emitter array dot circles, it will return the get circles function. So rather than having to write emitter array dot get circles with the open and close parentheses, I can just write def that way I can just write emitter array dot circles and it will return the same thing. Just makes life a little bit easier having that shorthand. So let's go ahead and see what we can do with this. So let's go ahead and create a variable called n. This will be something like 10. So this will be 10 emitters. I think the easiest way to start off would be to say, let's have a linear array of emitters. So let's have all, let's have 10 emitters all spread out on the x-axis. We can do that here. So let's call this call it demo one linear array of emitters. So it's going to be a linear array of emitters. Okay. We're going to need is x coordinates. So I'm using just lambda as the as could go from a quarter wavelength to a quarter wavelength on on the x-axis, but that's not actually there's no requirement that this has to be a particular span, a particular um, range. These could be anywhere. And in fact, later on, we'll just put some randomly in there and see what happens. I'll try and make some interesting thing happen. You can use the zeros like function. So this will return for the y array, we will return a vector, which is zero with the same length as XS and the same data type technically. So zero is like quite a nice function. Phi, let's all set phi to zero for now. So again, we can do, let's just do zeros like again. Okay, so there are three different arrays that we'll need to put in and then we can do something here. So we can say for i in range, we can do n. So then we're going to create 10 emitters and each emitter is going to be spaced by uh, on the x-axis as determined by this xs on the y-axis they're all going to have a value of zero and then we need to create an emitter array so let's get rid of the emitter down here we're not going to be doing that anymore we are going to be creating an emitter array so let's call it yeah let's call it emitter array So we'll create a new emitter array and as we saw above, it doesn't take anything in its constructor. What we can do here is say emitter array dot add emitter, which was a function we defined and we can actually add the emitter to it. Okay. So that there should have created 10 emitters all spaced on the X axis, each with the same phase of zero, each with the same Y quant as zero, each with the same wave speed and frequency. We need to go into our update function, increment our emitter array every time the plot, every time a plot frame is called. And let's have a look. And this is not correct. So what's gone wrong here? So it looks like it's only updating this last emitter, which actually makes complete sense because what actually happens in this update function, it needs a list of objects that's changed. So it's not just sufficient to say, here are 10 circles that need plotting. You need to put in the update function what has changed. 
and that's quite simple because we can just do emit array dot circles remember we define this property above that will return all the individual circles from all the individual emitters within the emitter array itself and that then tells the update function that all these things have changed that might work nope and the reason it doesn't work is actually quite simple it's because this needs to be emitter array emitter array dot circles and go ahead and run that instead we see something is happening but again we're running into the problem that we're having to wait for the initial wave to reach the first lambda equals the, the the next end step in the lambda before it's actually plotted so we can go ahead and get rid of that so if we just look at our emitter array we can add in a function let's call it remove offsets so what this will do is once all the emitters have been added we will go over all of the different emitters inside the emitter array and we will extract the value of t0 remember t0 is how long each emitter has to wait before actually plotting um, plotting the circles and then we'll add that to a list called offsets we'll then identify the minimum of that list so this is the minimum time that we'd be waiting so for example let's pretend that based on the initial input of phase the time we'll be waiting from starting the actual simulation so the animated plot to the first wave being drawn is a certain time but by taking that time off all of the individual emitters we can actually get it so that when the first one is ready to actually start drawing the circle then then it does so immediately so we create this function called remove offset and all we need to do is add is to call that function once once all of the emitter arrays have been created which is here all the emitter arrays have been created we then call this remove offset function go ahead and plot it you see it's now plotting immediately and we're getting some very strange behavior let's try and figure out what's going on so it looks like we're getting a permanent circle being drawn that's then not been incremented so it's not been changed that's happening all the way up here so if we go ahead and try and find where that's happening so this little problem was solved by adding in a return in our initialization function so in the initialization function we tell it that these are the objects that are going to change so obviously we added a certain number of circles to our plot it just needs to know that on the initialization what the initial state of those circles is so that's now working we're going to create a new new for loop and it's going to say for emitter in emitter array dot emitters so we're going to loop over all the individual emitters we're then going to add a patch to our plot that takes so that it's going to be a circle patch it's going to be filled it's going to be radius of 0.2 and it's going to be filled in purple and the actual value of this is going to be that emitter dot r and we're going to cast that to a tuple so remember an emitter itself has an xy location so where it's located xy and that was stored in this variable r which is a vector of x and y we're going to add in a purple circular patch so there we are so you see here we have this little circular patch in the middle which is the location of our individual emitters so this is working really nicely we've now got the situation where we can add many individual emitters within this object called an emitter array and now we can start doing things a bit more interesting so here we have the same phase across all of the different emitters and the result is that they're adding up to an intense an intense line or an intense region of signal so whatever they're emitting so if this was a antenna this would be an electromagnetic wave so this would be an intense region of electromagnetic wave 
in which they're all adding up in the forward direction. So someone far away, say standing here, would experience an intense burst of electromagnetic waves in this direction. If someone was stood here, not so much. And so now we can actually start playing about and seeing, well, what does this mean? So let's keep the same linear array. Okay, so let's save this. Let's put this in a nice bounding box of hashes. This will be our demo one. Now let's create a second demo. So if we comment that out, create a second demo. Let's see what happens when we move, when we actually put these antennas in a different location. So let's have, let's do something even more interesting. Let's do a rotation. Let's have an array of emitters and then let's actually physically rotate them by 45 degrees. And then let's see what happens. So you see now that the antenna, the emitters have been physically rotated by 45 degrees and they're still emitting in the same direction relative to the emitters themselves. So if you look here, you have this intense band of signal in the forward direction and the side direction is much less. And also notice that the, the secondary band, so the back lobe, goes in the opposite direction. And what, what we could do now is you can see, well, what's this back lobe doing? Why is it there? And the simple answer is there's a line of symmetry. So these emitters all lie along a line. So that anything we do in one direction to steer the beam is going to happen in the backwards direction. Let's just have a look at that. So that it's going to be mirrored along that line of symmetry. So let's change the phase. So rather than have the same phase now across all of the emitters, let's sweep the phase. Each of the individual waves is experiencing a different phase. And it's done in such a way the waves all add up in this direction so relative to the normal of this line it's summing up to be 90 degrees rotated around the normal so this this normal in this direction and all the waves are adding up here to a really intense value here and a really weak value at the back let's change it to something slightly different we can see that we do indeed change it to something at a different angle. So this is really nice. This is showing how the how just changing the phase of these individual emitters can change the direction in which they begin to emit, which is really nice. We do have one problem with the plot though, is that when you plot it, you get all the circles at once and you get this weird effect as they all jump in. What would be nice is if we could have some way of saying only when what the only when say the circle with index n equals zero has expanded to n equals one does the n equals one circle is then plotted and the easiest way to do that is a very simple one line function so when we increment our emitter itself we basically say that if the time is such that the inner the inner wave so that n equals zero the you know the n equals zero circle has expanded to n equals one then you can start then plotting the n equals one wave and likewise for n equals one only when it's expanded to become n equals two will that wave then be drawn and that can be done by this function here so what we're basically doing is setting the wave to be invisible so setting the circle to be invisible before it's ready and let's just play that so now we end up with this and it's a nice looking phased array which actually appears to begin emitting when we start the plot and again, we can see that this line of symmetry, so along our linear array of elements, so our linear array of emitters, there is a line of symmetry. So it means anything we try and do to beam steer in one direction will be mirrored along this line of symmetry. So I think that's where I'll leave this video. It's gotten quite long as it is. In the next video and probably final video, we will take a look at some more examples. So we'll look what happens if rather than having just a linear sweeping phase, which can direct the signal in just linear directions. See what happens when we actually apply some more complicated phase scenarios. So can we make it so that all the waves focus, for example, at one particular spot?
And then we'll also do an example where we see what happens when the arrays themselves are not linear. So what is if we just distribute these emitters randomly in space? Can we still get the same behavior? Can we still get it to behave the same in which we can still steer a beam in one direction and still perhaps focus a beam at another place? So I think the next video, the, the, the final video, should be very interesting. So stay tuned for that. Thank you very much.